Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Really quick, how many of you showed up here at 9 o'clock? Anybody? Come on, let's just own it. There's a couple. Everybody look around. Kind of feel bad for them. They got an extra hour here, so they're super spiritual today. They've been at church for an extra hour consuming coffee or they went and got breakfast. But let's, let's give it up for all the people who are going to show up at 11 o'clock. If we can end up, yeah, right? If we can end really early, we can all get out of here real quick, and they'll think the rapture happened, right? And they've all been left behind. We can really mess with them. And so, uh, yeah, so that would be awesome. But, man, this is fun. Uh, I was really excited, um, and I was also a little nervous because if I'm honest with you, 9 o'clock is normally like warm, warm-up service, right? Get all the kinks out, make sure it's not like four hours long of preaching, and then 11 o'clock more relaxed. So there's only, there's only one shot during this series to get it right, but I really am excited, as Pastor Jonathan said, as Mike said, as we start a brand new series. We're calling Mind Hack over these next five weeks. The tagline for this series is, is change your thinking, change your life. And the reason we're doing this series is simply because of this. I believe, we believe here at our church that our mind is a great battlefield. How many of you understand that to be true in your lives? Your mind is a great battlefield for almost every one of us in almost every situation the battles we face in life are won or lost up here they're won or lost in our mind how many of you have experienced those battles you've experienced even maybe this week you've experienced some of those battles in your mind I was thinking about as preparing for this message I was thinking about some of these battles that have taken place in my mind and I was thinking back to just a few weeks ago Um, how many of you have been to Knobles Knobles. If you've never been to Knobles, little plug, it's the best theme park ever, especially if you're cheap because you don't pay to get in or to park. You just go in there. You can, you can spend a whole day just watching people. It's pure entertainment, right? But your kids, if they want to go on rides, you pay for them to go on rides, and it's just a great, great place to kind of hang out. And so typically every year we go with my in-laws uh, for a couple days to Knobles in the summer, and so we were doing that again just a few weeks ago. Uh, we went up on a Monday and Tuesday. On Monday we went to the theme park, one hung out all day, had a lot of fun, slept overnight at a hotel, and then on Tuesday we went back, and we were going to go to their water park. Now, I've never been to their water park. How, how many of you have been to the water park there? By water park, I mean huge pool, right? It's one big pool with a couple slides in the pool, a couple diving boards, and then there's a couple slides that kind of go down the mountain. But it's an awesome, an awesome little kind of water park. And so we went to the water park on Tuesday, and uh, we get there around noon. It's a really, really hot day, so the water park is really, really crowded. We get there around noon. We're eating lunch together. All the kids are running around. We're over by the snack bar. We're about to get into the pool, throw all the trash away, do all that. We're about to walk in the pool, and all of a sudden I look, and I realize that Layton, our oldest daughter, is not here anymore. Like, she's not in our group anymore. How many of you parents, you've ever had one of those moments where you can't find one of your children? Right? She's our fourth, so I was like, oh, well, no, one, three out of four is not bad, right? And so I'm just kidding. No, in that moment, I'm going, all right, this is not good. Where's Leighton? I turned to Tiff. I turned to my in-laws. I said, where's Leighton? Anybody see Leighton? We thought maybe she had run around, you know, by the trash can, or maybe she ran to the pool. And so we were like, I'll, I'll go look in the shallow end of the pool. Maybe she thinks we're all following her. So I walk over to the shallow end of the pool. I start looking for Leighton, and I don't see her anywhere. She had a bright pink bathing suit on. She would have been pretty easy to spot. I don't see her anywhere. And so in this moment, I'm I'm a little bit anxious, but I don't know where she is. I run back to where we were sitting. I say, is, is Leighton here? Is she around here? And she's not there at this point. And so we calmly start looking around. I start walking around the entire pool looking for, for our daughter, Leighton. My, my father-in-law goes, walks towards their, their kitty area. My, my grandmother, my mother-in-law is sitting in the, where we were sitting so that she's there in case Leighton comes back. And we start to, to look for our daughter, Leighton. And as we look around the pool, I'm looking around this whole pool, and I still don't see her anywhere. And I'm getting a little bit nervous, but in those moments, how many of you, you know, like, you're, you're trying to fight your thoughts? Because in those moments, all the absolute worst thoughts are coming to your mind, right? When you don't know. The, the more that time passes, maybe you're not like me, but in those moments, every bad, you know, newspaper article or, or story on the internet or terrible Lifetime movie or whatever else is going on, everything is going through my mind. Your daughter's lost. You, you know, somebody stole her. Somebody's going to hurt her. She's drowning. All the worst thoughts start going through my mind. And so as a couple minutes pass, we still don't find her. I go to one of the lifeguards. I say, hey, uh, I don't know where my daughter is. Do you have a procedure for this, helping us out or whatever? They calmly start, you know, calling over the other lifeguards. And I'm like, I'm just going to go continue to look, right? I'm, I start to like kind of lap around this pool, just trying to spot her. And, and as I'm doing this, I'm praying like, Lord, help me to be calm. Help me to be collected. Help me to see her. Help me to have, to see the right things and all these moments. But as time passes, it's getting harder and harder to stay calm. At this point, it's been about 10 to 15 minutes, and we still have not found her, and I'm a little bit freaked out, and I was doing okay until I looked at my wife, 
And she was very terrified. She had a look on her face like you need to find her, like she was about to break down. And so at that moment, I'm really getting scared. I start really running. I'm running through the locker room at this point. I'm yelling her name. I go to the, the one entrance of the park, make sure nobody's taking her out there. I'm doing all of this, and I'm kind of frantic at this point. I, come, I, I think in my mind, I don't even have my cell phone with me, so if she's back with my, my in-laws, I, can't even, I don't even know. So I, I decide I'm going to run back to where we sit. Maybe she's back. Maybe she came back, and she's sitting with, with my, my in-laws at that point. And as I'm running back, I, I, I look back, and she's still not there. And I turn, I'm like, I'm about to make some more laps around this pool. And as I turn to make another lap around the pool to look for my daughter, who do you think comes walking by? Not a care in the world, oblivious to the chaos that's been going on. She comes walking right by me. I'm like, Layton, where were you? Right? I'm like trying to stay calm. But in that moment, I wasn't real calm. I was like, where were you? I was in the pool. I'm like, what were you doing in the pool? I told Pop-Pop. When Pop-Pop did it, no, nobody heard you. And I'm like, go back and sit with Grandma right now, right? Do not move an inch. Sit right next to her. I got to go find your mom, the lifeguards, the FBI, everybody else that's looking in this moment. I got to go tell them to stop the search, right? And so I go and I tell everybody, I find Tiff. She's at the front of the park, a little bit teary-eyed, right? And I find her. I said, we found her. She's fine. She's back with, with Grandma. Let's not kill her, right? Let's be calm and collected in this moment. And we walk back, and we're just relieved in that moment, right? When, when you've ever been through a situation like that even though it's only 15 minutes it feels like eternity and you're relieved in that moment and you're just excited that she's fine and you're just and I and I go and I sit with my daughter and I, and I put my arms around her and I said Layton and she's bawling at this point right and you know what she's bawling about she's not even upset she doesn't think she did anything wrong she's bawling because she thinks she's not gonna be able to go in the pool anymore right <laughs> I was in there for 15 minutes and the day's over right and so I sit her down and I, and I hug her and I tell her I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry for yelling. Daddy was just freaked out. We didn't know where you were. All the things were going through my mind. I feel like my job is to protect you and I feel like I failed. And, and in that moment, I thought, it's just like so many other battles, right? I mean, it wasn't even based on reality because in reality, there's huge fences around that entire park. There's literally one exit that they could possibly go out, right? If I was thinking realistically, like, most likely if she was, something happened in the pool, there would have been, there's tons of people around. They're not going to let her drown. There's lifeguards everywhere. Realistically, if I would have just kept thinking realistically, she was probably fine. But in that moment, it wasn't about reality. It was about my mind's ability to go through every worst case scenario. And I was thinking in my mind, I was thinking, isn't that how it often is in the battles in our lives? It's, it's often... It's often the, the constant battle that we have waging in our mind. Those thoughts, you, you failed as a father. You lost your child. You let her get hurt. She's drowning. All these different, these, these thoughts that were not true thoughts, were not godly thoughts of the thoughts that were, were going through my head in that moment. And I was thinking in most situations in our lives, right, in most situations that we deal with, there's always this battle going on in our minds. There's always this battle. And, and oftentimes this battle comes down to, will I, will I believe the truth of what God says to be true about me? Or will I listen to the lies? Will I allow my mind to be flooded with negative thoughts or will I choose to focus on positive thoughts? Will I allow myself to be filled with worry and anxiety or will I allow the peace of God to rule in my heart? How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've experienced this in your, your life. In fact, I would say this. Most of us, the battle starts and ends right here. And if you think about your thoughts and if you think about your life where you're living right now, how your life is right now, I, I think if you were to look at your life and evaluate your life, I think the life that you're living right now is usually a pretty good reflection of the thoughts that you're thinking. Right? I'm not saying that everything is just like positive thoughts or anything like that, but most of the time, the things that you struggle with, the things that you, you deal with on a consistent basis, the, the things that you fail in most of the time in your life, usually come down to the fact that we, we focus our thoughts on the wrong things. We dwell on the wrong things. And so that's why we say in this series, our tagline is change your thinking, change your life. Because I truly believe that if you change your thinking, if you line your thinking up with what God's word says to be true, it has the potential to radically transform your life. And so that's what we're going to talk about over these next few weeks. Today we're going to kind of set the stage, the table for the entire series. And then over the next few weeks, you're going to hear from a bunch of our different pastors, and they're going to kind of break it down uh, point by point, idea by idea. So they're going to talk about things like, how do we know we have the mind of Christ? What does that actually mean? How do we manage our mind, our thoughts on a daily basis? How do we deal with the thoughts when it comes to sin and, and temptation? And so let me encourage you to be here every week for the next five weeks at 10 o'clock. Because I believe that if you will be here and not only listen to what we talk about, but actually put it into practice. Not just, not just hear it, right? Because that doesn't change us, but it's applying it to our lives. If you would listen to what we're talking about, apply it to your lives, that it has the potential to radically transform 
your walk with the Lord. And so before we, we jump into what we're talking about this morning, would you pray with me? Let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts today. Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to go to your word. I pray that over these next few weeks, Lord, in these few moments here today, that you would speak to us, that you would reveal your heart to us, that you would show us areas in our, our mind where we've allowed our thinking to, to go away from what you would want us to think. And pr Lord, I pray that you would just radically transform us and change us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here's what we're going to do to start uh, what we're talking about this morning. We're going to do something I want to call a thought audit, okay? A we're going to take a little bit of an inventory. So if you're taking notes, how many of you are taking notes today? You got your piece of paper. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to put this next thing up on the screen, this thought audit. I want you to write down on the screen those little scales. We're going to take a little bit of an inventory. If you, you're not taking notes, um, mentally take an inventory right now uh, of where you're at. We're going to take a little bit of an inventory, and, and we have some extremes up there, and I want you to kind of just think about your life. Just think about your thought life over the last couple days, this last weekend. And we're going to take a little bit of an inventory of where our thought life is. And so let's think of the first one, the worried versus peaceful thoughts. How many of you, if you think about your life, and you think about the way you've thought recently, how many of you would say that your thoughts are, are often more towards the worried side? That if you think about your life, you're constantly worried about your job, or worried about your income, or you're worried about your family, or you're worried about what people think about you, you're constantly anxious, you're worried about the future, all these other kinds of worried thoughts that can kind of flow through our minds, or, or, or how close are we to the peaceful side of things, where we allow the peace of God to, to rule and reign in our lives, you're not worried all the time, you're, you're at peace, you're able to sleep at night, some of you, your thoughts are, are so scattered, you're, you're so out of peace that you can't even sleep at night because your thoughts are constantly running, you're worried about the next day, all the things you have to do, there's no peace in your life, it robs you of even sleep, come on, some of us, we fall somewhere on that scale, and a lot of times, if I'm going to be honest with you, I'm, I'm definitely down towards the worried side. It's just easy. It's easy to think worried thoughts. It's easy to be worried all of the time. In that situation at Knobles, I wasn't anywhere near the peaceful side of things, right? It was constant worried. How about the other one? Positive versus a negative mindset. Which one do you think you genuinely are? Are you generally negative about life, about your job, about your family, about your spouse, about everything that's going on in your life? Are you constantly critical about people? Right? When you get in your car, do you absolutely all the time think everybody else is the worst driver in the world and you're the best? Are you negative in your mindset? Do you always feel like your life is hard and it's never going to get better? It's only going to get worse. You are a walking Eeyore, right? Or are you positive? Do you look at your life even when life is difficult at times and you go, yeah, life is hard, but I understand that God is still good. His goodness is still there. He's working everything out for good in my life. I see the best in people. I choose to see the best in people. My thoughts are more positive. Do you have a negative mindset or a positive mindset? And then the last one, let's contrast and, and compare worldliness versus eternal. Do you look at your life and when you think about the things you think about, is your thoughts more worldly dominated? Meaning, what can I get out of this life? How can I live this life to the fullest for my pleasure? How can I get the most money? How can I have the best job? How can I have the most pleasure? Are you constantly chasing after your own wants, your own selfish desires, or do you live with an eternal mindset? How can I live my life to honor God? How can my life be a worship to God? How can I live to be a blessing to other people? How can I represent Jesus well in this life? Is it more worldly or more eternal? Because I think if we do this type of thing correctly, and if we do it accurately, and if we're honest with ourselves, I think that this, this scale kind of paints an accurate picture of our current mindset. And I think what we have to understand is our thoughts are powerful, that our life is typically moving in the direction of our most powerful thoughts. I heard a pastor say it like this. He says, you can't have a, a positive life when you have a negative mindset. It's impossible to live the life that God desires for you to live if your mind is constantly filled with negative things. You'll never live that new creation life that God desires for you to live if you constantly have a negative mindset mindset change your thinking change your life and so what i want to do this morning is we're going to explore the key verse for our series found in romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 and we're going to talk this morning about this idea of renewing your mind this biblical concept and the main idea i want to keep coming back to today the main thought i want you to to leave here understanding is simply this it's impossible to live a new life without a renewed mind it's impossible to live a new life, a transformed life, without experiencing 
a renewed mind. So let's look at Romans chapter 12 together, verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I want to stop there for a second. Paul, in this portion of Scripture, is talking to people who are followers of Christ. If you're in here this morning and you're a Christian, this verse is directed to you. He's saying, if you're a Christian, what should you do in view of the mercy you have experienced, in in light of what God has done in your life, in light of the, the forgiveness that you've experienced, in light of the grace you've experienced, how should you live your life? What should your life look like? That's what he's saying. In view of God's mercies, here's what you should do. Then he goes on to say this, our life pursuit, and this is for all of us as Christians, the life pursuit, the thing that we should be trying to pursue more than anything else when it comes to following Jesus is ultimately that our life would be a life of worship. You understand what that means? Not just Sunday mornings, we come and we check off our time, okay, I came to church on Sunday, I started my week with worship, that's not the goal. The goal isn't, you know, perfect church attendance. The goal is a, a lifestyle of worship. The way we do everything, we understand it is worship. The way we treat our families, that's worship. The way we treat our spouse, our loved ones, that's worship. The way we treat our coworkers, that's worship. The way we treat strangers when we're driving along the road, that's worship. Everything we do, the, the way we act when nobody else is around, it's supposed to be worship to God. The thoughts we think are supposed to be worship to God. He says, here's what you should do. Because you've been experienced salvation, because you've, you're a new creation in Christ, as it says in 2 Corinthians, right? It says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Because you're a new creation, here's what you should be striving to do, to live every day of your life, every moment of your life, as a life of worship. And then he says this, he says, you should live your life as living sacrifices. You want your life to be worship? then you live your life as a sacrifice. I don't know if you've done a lot of reading in the Old Testament, but if you've read about uh, sacrifices in the Old Testament, what do they normally have in common? They're dead, right? They're dead. They're, they're, They're not alive. So he says you should be a living sacrifice. Why? Because a sacrifice that's dead is only a sacrifice one time. But a living sacrifice is when you choose to die to yourself every single day. Every single day as a follower of Christ, you wake up and you say, okay, my life is not my own. I've been bought at a price. I'm going to honor God with my life, right? My, my words are not my own. The way I treat my family is not about me. My life is a living sacrifice. My life is an act of worship. I want everything I do and say to be worship. So I will continue to die every single day to myself, my desires, my wants. And I say, not about me. It's all about you, Jesus. That's the goal. Listen, none of us arrive there. None of us are perfect in that way. If you are, I'd like to meet you and call you Jesus. But you haven't arrived. But that's what we should be striving for. That's what our life should be about. It's not just about getting to heaven at some point. It's about living our lives in a way that glorifies God. My life is a life of worship. And then in verse 2, he goes on and he paints this picture of how this happens. The only way this takes place in our lives. He says in verse 2, and really this is the key verse for the series we're going to come back to. In verse 2 it says, do not conform to the pattern of of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not conform, be transformed. Do not conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I don't know if you noticed this, but there's really no middle ground in that statement. There's no gray areas Often what happens in our lives, if we're honest with ourselves, is we want to live the life that God wants us to live. We want to live a life that pleases him, but we try to do it with one foot in the world and one foot following Jesus. We try to get the best of both worlds. I I want to hold on to this area of my life. I don't want to surrender this area of my life. I I want to experience God's blessings. I want to experience the life he wants. I want my life to honor him, to be a life of worship, but I want to see how close I can walk to sin and how close I can walk to the world and still follow Jesus, but unfortunately it doesn't work that way. In fact, in, in, in 1 John, Chapter 2, the Bible says this, it says, Do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that are in this world, the lust and sensual craving of the flesh, the lust and longing of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, which is pretentious confidence in one's resources or in the stability of earthly things, these do not come from the Father, but are of the world. And the world is passing away, and with its lust, the shameful pursuits and ungodly longings. But the one who does the will of God and carries on his purposes lives forever. So again, 
two choices. We are either conformed to the world. And if we're conformed to the world, what will happen is we'll think like the world thinks. And then we'll start to do what the world does. We'll, we'll act like the world acts because we're thinking like the world thinks because our actions follow our, our thoughts. Or we can be transformed. And how does it say it happens? It doesn't say by trying to do a better job because oftentimes that's what we do. I just got to change my actions. I just got to do a work harder. I got to just try harder. He doesn't say that. He says if you want to be transformed, it all starts up here. You transform by the renewing of your mind. So how do we go about doing this? Like how do we go about having a renewal in our minds? What does renewing our minds even mean? Well, one of the best definitions that I could kind of come up with or even find was, was simply this. And I think this is simple and hopefully easy for us to understand. Renewing your mind is simply the process of exchanging lies for truth. Renewing your mind is the process of exchanging lies for truth. In other words, we all have messed up ways of thinking. Our brains are, are part of a, our fallen nature. You understand? Like we don't think the way God wants us. We're not born with the mind of Christ. We're not born with the, with the ability. Our, our mind is fallen just like the rest of our, our sinful nature. And not only that, but then we also have lots of things that have happened in our lives that have, that have caused us to think the way we think. We've dealt with rejection in our lives. And so our brain is pretty amazing, but what ends up happening is, think about it like this. If you walk from your front door to your, you know, your, your driveway or whatever, and you don't walk on a sidewalk, and you just walk across the grass over and over the same path every single day, what happens eventually? That grass starts to die, and it builds a little bit of a rut. You make your own natural sidewalk. It's so much cheaper, right? The same thing happens in our minds. When we think a certain way over and over again, it creates a neural pathway. And the only way to, to change that neural pathway is to replace it with a new neural pathway. It, it's the, it, the process. Renewing your mind is the process of exchanging those broken. Listen, this isn't about just being a positive thinker because sometimes people think that. Well, if you just say you're rich, you'll be rich. No, you'll probably be poor still, right? It's not just about, I'm, I'm rich, I speak richness over my life, because people look at it and they take it to that extreme. Or they do the other thing, they say, well, if I just had more information, if I just knew more, then I would be renewed. So we, we have information and information and information, but what we forget is information doesn't change us. It's information plus application that equals transformation. It doesn't change us just knowing more. That's not what any of this is about at all. It's about replacing the broken, sinful, fallen way of thinking that we've developed because of the way we're born and because of the things we've experienced in life and constantly replacing it with the truth of what God says to be true, what his word says to be true. The Bible paints this analogy when it comes to renewing your mind. It paints this picture uh, that it's a lot like changing your clothes. How many of you in here like to exercise? How many, let me rephrase this. How many of you exercise? You don't have to like it. I don't know many people who like it. Actually, there's some people at my gym that like it. But I don't like it that much. I like the way I feel afterwards. But I don't really like exercising that much, right? But if you exercise... I'll just be honest with you, and this is just a little bit transparent with you. I'm, uh, I'm one of those people when I work out, I am like a nasty, gross, sweaty mess. I'm just, I'm gross. I walk outside today, it'll be hot, I'll be dripping sweat. So I go to the gym, and I sweat like crazy. It's gross, it's disgusting. In fact, if I'm completely honest with you, if I go to the gym, and I walk out of there, and I'm not drenched in sweat, I don't feel like I did anything. I could have worked hard on stuff, but if I'm not, like, nasty, gross, that I have to take a shower... I don't feel like I actually worked out. So a lot of times during the week, me and Pastor Jonathan and Mike oftentimes will go to the gym a couple times during the week during lunch, get a workout in, um, and then we'll get showers and come back, to, come back to work. And so every single day, sweaty and gross, go through that. Can you imagine for a second, if you went to the gym and you get sweaty, if you're like me, you get really nasty, gross, sweaty, you go and get a shower, wash your hair, your body, get smell, put some deodorant on, you smell great. And immediately, you get out of the shower, smelling all nice and fresh, and you take those wet, sweaty socks and put them on. You take your dirty underwear and put them back on. You take your soaking wet shirt and, you're, and you go, well, I'm clean, so I'm going to just go back. Like, can you imagine? If I went back to work like that, I would be working by myself. Nobody want to be around me, right? Because I'd be gross. It's just disgusting. It's a disgusting thought. Well, the Bible says you're a new creation. You are new. You're fresh. You're clean. You got that nice shower. But oftentimes what ends up happening is we're a new creation, but we continue to put on our old nature we continue to put on our old mindset it'd be the same way as putting on those nasty clothes it's not what it, we're, we're called to take off the old right and put on the new the bible says it like this in ephesians chapter 4 it says with the lord's authority i say this to you live no longer as the gentiles do 
Gentiles here is just another word for unbelievers. Don't live like people who don't know Jesus, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature. Right? That involves something that you do. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Let the Holy Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes and put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and truly holy. So I just want to give us two things to do when it comes to renewing our minds. And again, we're going to explore these thoughts in much greater depth and detail throughout this series. How do we renew our mind? Number one, we do what the Bible says. We put off the old and we put on the new. We put off the old and we choose to put on the new. In Colossians 3, it says it like this. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ. And God, if you continue to read Colossians 3, it talks specifically in greater detail about the things you should be putting off. It says put off these, these parts of your nature, put off these ways of thinking, put off these other things, and put on your new nature which is created to be like Christ. It goes on to repeat what we read in Ephesians. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to learn to put off the old, the old way of thinking, the lies that we've believed in our lives, that we've, that we've held on to, as, that we've defined ourselves by as, as truth. And we need to choose through repentance to, and, and daily confession to put off thoughts like this. Some of these thoughts, let me tell you something that maybe you've, that you've thought of in your life. I'm just the same person I used to be. I'm still the same person. I don't feel like a new creation. I can't change. How many of you ever thought that thought? I can't change. I can't change at all. I have to earn God's grace. I have to continue to work for God's grace in my life. God has given up on me. Today is going to be horrible. Let me tell you, not a great way to start your day. You're really not setting yourself up for success, right? Today's going to be terrible. My family is terrible. If I just had more money, I would be more happy. All of these lies that we begin to believe that are not based on truth at all. We need to take off of the old. We need to put away the old way of thinking and we need to replace it, exchange it with the truth of God's word. Truth like this, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus has died for all of my sins. God is not against me, but he is for me. I am a new creation. I'm not trying to be a new creation. I'm not working to be a new creation. I am a new creation in Christ right now. God is working for good, everything in my life, because he's called me according to his purposes. We need to replace the lies that we believe with the truth of God's word. And in order for us to do that, we have to be intentional about taking time to know and meditate on God's word. Do you understand? It's impossible to replace the lies with the truth of God's word if you don't ever spend time in God's word. It's impossible. It's not going to just happen. If you put the, the Bible under your pillow at night and you sleep on it, it doesn't happen by like osmosis, right? You need to spend time meditating, knowing God's word. I heard someone say it like this. I thought this was good. They said, your mind is the object of renewal. God's word is the instrument of renewal, and the Holy Spirit is the agent of renewal. In other words, the Holy Spirit's like the doctor, and the word is the scalpel. And our, our mind is, is what's getting a little bit of a brain surgery done. We need to invite the Holy Spirit into our time in God's word. Invite him into the time. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, one of his jobs is to lead us into all truth. To lead us into all truth. He reveals truth to us. He speaks truth to us. And so we need to invite the Holy Spirit to, to guide us when we take time in God's word. To, to change us and to show us things in our life that aren't as they should be. And the Holy Spirit works through the word and radically transforms us. We need to take off the old and put on the new. And then the next step if you're taking notes is simply this. Ready? Repeat, repeat, repeat. Take off the old, put on the new, repeat, repeat, repeat. Do it over and over. This isn't a once and done type of thing. This isn't I said a prayer so I'm good to go for the rest of my life type of, of thing. This is a, a daily process from, from now until the time that you die or Jesus comes back. Right? Like you wouldn't change your clothes just one time. Right? I went to the gym on Monday, I changed my clothes. The rest of the week I'm just going to wear the same dirty clothes. That would be gross. 
I need to do it every single day. Every single time I go to the gym, I need to be renewed. I need to put on the, the old, take off the old, put on the new, right? The same is true when it comes to our thoughts. We have to continually do this. This is a lifelong process of renewing our mind. Change doesn't happen overnight. How many of you ever experienced that in your life? How many of you go, you know what, I'm going to be real fit. I'll go to the gym one time. Look at me. I am so good looking. It doesn't work that way, right? It's a process. It takes time to lose weight to transform your body. The same is true when it comes to our minds. You're not going to fix the years and years of, of, of bad thinking and wrong thinking by simply taking your thought one time and, and saying, okay, well, I'm going to change my thought. It doesn't happen like that. It's a process of continually doing this. It's really not about trying. It's about training, right? There's a difference. How many of you understand there's an enormous difference between trying to do something and training to do something? Like, for instance, how many of you in here, you could do a marathon today? Put your hands up. Let's look at all the healthy people. Like, if you want, right now, after church, you, you could, in your, in your church clothes right now, you could go out and run 23 miles right this second. Anybody? I saw some people raising their hands. Listen, it doesn't matter how hard I tried, I would not be able to do that unless I was able to break it up over a week with sleep and meals in between, right? Or unless there was absolutely no time limit. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't try. It doesn't matter how hard I try, I wouldn't be able to do it. But I tell you what, I could train to do it. I could train myself to do it. I could follow a regimen for a while, running certain amounts at a time, working on, on, on my eating, working on eating the right thing during the race, all this different kind of thing. I could train myself to run a marathon, but I could not try right now to just do it because there's a huge difference between trying and training. And oftentimes when it comes to our thoughts, when it comes to making changes in our lives, we just try to do it. And even if you look at that verse, it's not about trying, it's about dying to ourselves anyway, right? Right? A living sacrifice doesn't try to be a sacrifice, it dies to itself, that's how it becomes a sacrifice. It's not about, about trying, it's about training ourselves over and over, repeat, repeat, repeat. I want to look at one verse when it comes to this as we close this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says it like this. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought, and we make it obedient to Christ. Pastor Jonathan is going to share this verse and explore this verse a little bit more in a few weeks, but I want to just think about that for a second, that idea of taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ. I was reading about this this week as I was preparing. Scientists believe on the low end that we have around 50,000, on the high end, 80,000. They believe that we have between 50,000 and 80,000 thoughts every single day. Our brains are little computers. We have so many thoughts. A lot of times those, those thoughts are repeated, but we have between 50,000 and 80,000 thoughts every single day. According to this verse, we have a responsibility in what we do with those thoughts. Now, we may not always be able to control the thoughts we think, but the Bible says that we have a responsibility to take those thoughts captive, Right, to take every thought captive. This is a, a moment by moment, second by second, decision by decision, repeat, repeat, repeat type of step, right? To take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. So many times we live the opposite of this, don't we? We live our lives, if we're honest, we live our lives like we're a prisoner to our thoughts. I've thought this way for my whole life. I've continued to think this way. There's no way to, to win this battle. I'm never going to get over this sin in my life. I'm never going to become that new creation that God has called me. I'm always going to struggle with this. I'm never going to get better. I'm a prisoner to these thoughts that I believed about myself. Right? All of these different things. We live our lives like we're a prisoner to our thoughts, but the Bible says it's the opposite, that our thoughts are our prisoner. That our job as followers of Christ is when we realize a thought doesn't line up with the truth of God's word, we're not supposed to just submit to it and go, okay, it's just my thoughts, it's what it is, I have to just listen to it, it's my thoughts, right? No, 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 that's not what we do. We listen to our thoughts and when we realize a thought doesn't line up with the truth of God's word, we take it prisoner. We grab a hold of it and we say, no, 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 I don't listen to this thought because this isn't the truth of what God says to be true. And because this doesn't line up, I'm holding on to this. I'm going to beat this thought into submission and line it up with the truth of God's word because I'm not a prisoner to my thoughts. My thoughts are a prisoner to my God. I take my thoughts captive and I make them obedient to God's word. And so here's what I want to do this morning as we close. This is a really simple and also very difficult, all at the same time, challenge for us this week. I want to challenge us this week to simply just try to live out this one principle. To live out this, this principle of taking your thoughts captive and making them obedient to Christ. I want to challenge you to do this by reading Romans chapter 8. Write down Romans chapter 8 somewhere. Mark it in your Bibles. I want you to read Romans chapter 8 
over and over and over and over till the, the, the thoughts and the concepts of Romans chapter 8 become second nature to you. Romans chapter 8 is a book of the, a, 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 a chapter in Romans that is full of God's promises for you and for me. If you're a follower of Christ, the promises in Romans chapter 8 are for you. They're, they're for you. And so what I want you to do is I want you to make it personal. And every time you have a line, maybe you even take a, a notebook this week and you begin to write down the thoughts that you have. And when you write, you just take a notebook and you write down thoughts and you maybe make two columns, right? Maybe you're a type A person and you got to do something like this. And so you write two columns and be like, this is not the right type of thought. This is the truth of God's word. This is the thought that I'm having that doesn't line up with the truth. So I'm going to take this thought captive and I'm going to make it obedient to this other thought over here. Do it as practically as you need to be. I want to share some of these thoughts with you as we close today. Would you stand with me? I want to share some of these thoughts as we, as we end. And again, I want you to make these personal this week. Verse 1 of Romans chapter 8 says, There is no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. That means if you are a follower of Christ, if you're in Christ, the next time the voice of the enemy speaks lies to you of condemnation, you're not worthy of God's love. You're not good enough. God never loved you. All these different lies that we tend to believe, you take that thought captive. You say, I don't have to believe any condemnation because I am new in Christ Jesus. Verse 2 says, The Spirit has set you free from sin and death. You're not a prisoner to the sin that you've struggled with even your whole life. Because if you're in Christ, the, the Spirit has set you free from that sin. Another verse says it like this. says, the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The resurrecting power that conquered the grave is living in your life as a power of Christ. That's powerful. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You're not a prisoner to your thoughts. You are led by God and thus a child of God. And because you're a child of God, you go to God not as a slave, but as Abba Father, Daddy God. He's a loving father and cares about your needs, cares about your desires, cares about your wants. You don't go to him and approach him just in fear. You go to him as a loving father who cares about you. Through Christ, you are an heir of God, inheriting divine blessings. Verse 23, your body will be redeemed, set free, and made home. No matter what you're suffering with or dealing with right now, you have a hope to look forward to. The Spirit helps you in your weakness with intercessions from deep inside. you got the Holy Spirit interceding for you, praying for you, lifting you up before God when you're dealing with stuff in your life. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Verse 29 through 30, God takes initiative to know you, to guide you, to call you, to justify you, helping you to become more and more like Jesus. You're not in this alone. God is working in your life. If God is for you, in verse 31 it says, who can be against you? In all things, verse 37, you are more than a conqueror through Christ's love. And here's my favorite verse, my favorite verse since I was a teenager, Romans 8, 38, and 39. Nothing, absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Come on, those are powerful promises to get a hold of in your life. If you constantly struggle in the battlefield, I want to challenge you to practically live this out, to apply this this week. Let me tell you this, it's going to get difficult. I promise you, if you begin to do this in your life, it's not going to get easier before it gets harder. The enemy will attack you and your thoughts because he wants you to live defeated and he understands that you cannot live the transformed life without a renewed mind. But I want to challenge you to put this into practice in your life. With every head bowed and eyes closed as we close today, let me first say this before we go into a time of worship. If you're in here today, and you don't yet know Jesus, you've never opened your life to a relationship with Him, you've never surrendered your life to His leading, I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. Today's a day. It's not an accident that you walk through these doors. It doesn't matter if it's your first time or you've been here hundreds of times. If you don't know Jesus, He's knocking on your heart right now, and He's, and he's asking you to open your heart, to surrender your life to Him, to give Him control. You've tried it your way, and you failed time and time again, and He said, okay, now it's my turn to have rain. And if you're in here today, and you feel that tug on your heart, and you want to say yes to Jesus today, would you just raise your hand right now so I know I'm praying with you? I'm going to look around real quick. If there's anybody that's hand is raised in this room, I'm going to look around for just a moment here so I know I'm praying with you. It's hard to see, so if there's somebody that's hands up, we're going to celebrate with you. If you did raise your hand, I would encourage you to take the time to to write on the, the connection card to let us know that you made that decision so we can get in contact with you or come up and pray with some of our prayer partners that are going to be up here in just a moment. Let them know that you made that decision today. We want to walk with you as you begin this journey as a follower of Christ. And if you're in here today and you are a follower of Christ, but you've struggled to experience transformation in your life, and most of the struggles you realize have been in your brain, would you just raise your hand right now so we can pray together? 
There's been those thoughts that have run through your mind for a long time, those thoughts that have, that have made you so, so much of a slave to your past, to your mistakes. And today you're making a choice and you're saying, I'm not going to live any longer as a slave to my thoughts. I'm not going to live every long, any longer as a slave to my past. I am a new creation in Christ and I'm going to continue to put on the new and take off the old. doesn't matter if I feel like a new creation. I'm going to walk and live my life as a new creation because I know what God says to be true is bigger than any thoughts or lies of the enemy that I hear in my mind. As we pray today, Father, I thank you, Lord, for every hand that is raised right now. Lord, we want to live our lives as transformed creation. We want to live as new creations, but we understand that it's impossible to live as a new creation without a renewed mind. So every single moment this week, every single day, when we, when we find ourselves dwelling on thoughts that are not true, when we find ourselves uh, consumed with thoughts that don't line up with the truth, we're going to take those thoughts captive. We're going to make them obedient to the truth of your word. We're going to take time to, to spend in the word so we can know your truth. And your truth will set us free. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're going to do in our lives over these next few weeks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.